we often talk about projects being the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities to achieve the project's goals so that we can deliver benefits to our clients and they will reap those benefits and value from those benefits. Now, what happens if you're on a project where you have the triple constraint with one taken out of your site? In other words, you have schedule, you have scope, but you don't have cost. Think about that. Many projects in today's world do not have the cost constraint clearly defined. And if you work in government space, well, you probably are aware on many of these multi-year contracts, you do not have the ability to clearly see how much has been demarcated for the project, what the budget is, and moreover, what the cost of each work package is. What is the incremental budget that has been assigned to the project? You have no sight of it. So today, my question to you is, how do you manage a project if there's no budget? It could be a challenge, especially if you are a project manager in government space, moreover, a consultant or a contractor in government space. How would you handle that? Now, before we go into a lot of detail that I have, I would like to show you this quiz and I want you to honestly answer the question. You are a project manager on a significant project, highly visible. Which of these parameters that I'm about to show to you would you say are most important? Now, I want you to look at each of these parameters as having three points. I want you to use these points to emphasize areas you feel are more important. So for example, if you think, well, team satisfaction isn't as important as meeting schedule, I am going to take team satisfaction up to four, right? Or down to two or up to five or down to one, then do that. But balance it out so that you only have 18 at any one point. So let me show you an example. If we move team satisfaction down to two, then we can move schedule up to four. If we move budget up to five, then we must take scope down to one. You get what I'm saying? But at any point in time, we must have 18. So that will be four, nine, 10. 16 and 18, all right? So why not pause the recording and balance it out so that you have 18, but I want you to emphasize those that you feel are more important or you feel they're all the same, then just leave them exactly where they are. So you go for it. I'll give you a minute to think about it. All right, three, two, and one. I'm curious to know what came out on top, what stayed the same, what went down below. There's no right or wrong answer. But the reason why I'm asking you this is to make you think about schedule, cost, and scope, and for you to really deduce which of these is most important. So if I was looking at this for one, I would not keep customer needs at a three, and I would not keep team satisfaction at a three. I would move team satisfaction and customer needs 
at least to a four. So if I move customer needs to a four, I would move deliver all plan scope down to a two. And if I move team satisfaction up to a four, then I will have to move something down such as schedule. And if I say quality requirements are really important, I could move it up and move something else down, but I'm not inclined to move the budget down. And I'm not inclined to move quality any further. I'm just gonna leave it. That is one way you could look at this. It's not right or wrong. It depends on you, it depends on your perception, and it depends on the project. But one thing is for sure, my friends, no matter what you do, do not diminish the importance of your team being satisfied and meeting customer needs. And do not diminish the importance of quality. In fact, to be perfectly fair, we could move quality up here and we could, watch this, watch this, we could move planned scope down by one and move planned scope down here. So here we have two, five, six, 10, 14, 18. That is kind of what I was looking for you to do, okay? So why did I ask you to do this? I wanted you to think about the importance of all the other areas on the project in perspective to cost. Now, someone might say, if I do not meet cost, my project is doomed, but think about it like this. What if your team is not satisfied? If you do not have a satisfied team, you are likely to have issues with schedule anyway. So if your team is not really, really satisfied, then you're likely to not have a firm understanding of what we call the Agile Manifesto, which I am going to share with you right now. In the Agile Manifesto, one of the things that we espouse is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And there's a reason why individuals and interactions is first. There's also a reason why we say customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Do you see that it's very people driven? How about responding to change over delivering all planned scope? Do you see why this is now so important? What about working product? We're talking about those requirements, that quality requirement being inherent in the deliverable. So however you slice and dice it, my friends, it is extremely important that even if you are not managing with a budget, that you think about customer, team, quality. And you also have schedule and scope. So not having budget is not the worst thing that could ever happen on a project. All right, let's advance the conversation a little bit further. All right, so we've talked about the Agile Manifesto. Let's go into some more pragmatism regarding the triple constraint. The triple constraint could be looked at like this. We could say this is scope. On a predictive project, we say it's fixed and we have schedule and we have cost. In my mind, this is all well and good, but it's not enough. So let's say each of these was a side, okay? And let's say you don't have cost 
But what else do you have? You have quality. What else do you have? You have resources. Think about that for a second. So you have schedule, you have scope, you have quality, you have resources. Someone says, Phil, but what should I do with resources? If you have never really thought about the value of having resource information, I want you to think again. When we talk about the schedule performance index, the cost performance index, this is really earned value divided by planned value. And this is earned value divided by actual cost. Now, when you break earned value down, you can say earned value is the number of earned hours. You do not have to tie it to dollars at all points. If you do not have cost to work with on a project or you do not have budget to work with on a project, how about converting to hours? Or how about converting to time periods? Hours preferably because it's a unit that we're used to and it's very trackable. There's a company I trained up in Louisiana and what they did was work on value with resource hours. It worked perfectly for them. And I would advocate anyone that's struggling with having that budgetary amount, how about thinking about resource hours? Because earned value would be earned hours and planned value will be the planned hours. And what do we mean by planned versus earned? Let me give you an example. If you had a piece of work that had to be done, and let's say the piece of work was, we're gonna tile this road. And let's say we have a, a distance of 10 km. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, not tile, we're gonna, we are going to tar the road and it's 10 kilometers long. And let's say the effort is 5,000 hours in total. Let's say it was that, okay, 5,000 hours. If 5,000 hours is the planned value and you have half of the road done, at point X, right? You have 50% done, then your earned value, you can very easily say is 2,500 hours. You claim that value when you accomplish a particular amount of the work. So it does not take anything away from the formula Earned value is equal to planned value times percent complete. Or if you're looking at the bigger picture <clears throat> of the project, you would say the budget at completion times percent complete is earned value. You could still manage your project using earned value as you see fit, even if you do not have the cost. The same thing for the variances. If someone ended up spending, let's say on this road, to get to half of this point here, let's assume the actual hours, actual hours, let's say the actual hours you spent were 3,000 hours. Well, you can put this into a formula and you could say, the SPI equals EV over PV, and that is 2,500 over 2,500 because it's what was planned, right? But when it comes to the cost performance index, 
you have the earned value of 2,500 divided by the actual cost of 3,000. What does that give you? 0 0.83, I believe. So you have 0 0.83. This shows you your cost performance. You did not even need the dollars to do it. So all of these are a string of thoughts for you as far as how do you effectively manage a project when you do not have the budget? Well, you think about other things. You think about schedule, scope, resources, quality, just like we saw. You also think about the dimension of team satisfaction. So when we talk about resources, we talk about the human first, and then we talk about the physical, the human, and the physical. As a project manager, you shouldn't be bound by budget. You could also effectively manage your project by thinking about human and physical. So I want you to think about these things here. I saw six, it's usually chipmunks, but you could say, I saw squirrels Quietly roasting coffee, reading poetry stories. So I've changed the mnemonic because we don't have cost, but you have here as a project manager, scope to manage, schedule to manage, quality, resources, and we just say, don't forget the team as well, team and physical, we have communications, which is huge. We have risk, which is just massive. We have procurement, and you may not be privy to all the numbers, but we have stakeholder. So as a project manager, you have all of these things to combine, which we call integration. And if you do not have visibility of budget, you have many other things you should be thinking about. So let's see, you have scope, you have schedule, you have risk, you have quality. But very importantly, you have the team, you have stakeholders, and you have communications. Those are huge. Those are really big. So instead of thinking about the quant the uh, triple constraint, think about the quintuple constraint, or think about even more. Think about it like this. You have a multidimensional realm of possibilities. You have the schedule, you have the, the scope, you have the procurements, you have the quality, you have the risk, you have those. And honestly, those are kind of technical in nature, if you will, but don't forget, you also have on the lower end of things, which is gonna be our base, you have the people, which is the resources oriented one. You have the communications. You have the stakeholders. stakeholders, you have the integration. And in my mind, there is one more, which is not talked about as a knowledge area, 
But this is important because when you trace the structure, this is at the helm down here. And you know how I conceive this? This is the leadership. And my mentor, John C. Maxwell, he says, everything rises and falls on leadership. So how successful this project ends up being is driven by leadership. This is how you need to be thinking about leading your project. Not just managing stuff, but leading it. So what exactly is leadership? John also says the true measure of leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. In order to influence on your project, you need to know a thing or two about leadership. No leadership without influence and no influence without leadership. In order to influence, you need to remember there are five levels of leadership that get you inroads. You see how I have flipped your thinking from just schedule, cost, and scope to a lot more because it is a lot more. I've also brought in your horizon to think about the Agile Manifesto and the importance of it. Individuals and interactions, customer collaboration. And that is why I often say, why rewrite principles? So the Pembroke Guide 7th edition is coming out and it's got principles that have been written in there. But in my mind, that was not necessary because we already have great values and principles in the Agile Manifesto. Let's cover a few of the principles and it's, it's quite coincidental that just like the Agile Manifesto has 12, the new seventh edition will have 12, which I've covered in a previous video. And those are well and good, but I think these really needed to be underscored a whole lot more because they cover the gamut, whether you're working on an Agile project or you're working on a predictive project. So what am I talking about? Think about it like this. Principle one. Customer satisfaction and continuous delivery of value trumps everything. If you can just tweak your mindset a little bit to focus on customer and value, everything else will follow. That should be your number one priority to satisfy your customer, however you can do it whether it's in getting a report early, whether it's in getting a report as quickly as possible. Case in point, I wanna give a shout out to one of our students who I was having a conversation with over dinner last night. And Dre, our student, got certified as a PMP back in 2019. And one of the things Dre said, he said, for my direct manager, when I get a request for a report, I don't need to go scrambling for my laptop. I have a virtual drive that I can access right there from my phone. Punch in a few buttons, pull the report or the information I need and off it goes. That is satisfying your customer. Do you know that the one we call the boss is actually your customer. Did you know that? But that needs to be your highest priority. That's how to run a project. It's not about the cost. It's about the efficiencies and the customer focus that you place on the project. Secondly, welcome changing requirements. Now, if you've been a project manager for as long as I have, you might have had bad ideas, just like I did, about change requests. And as a junior project manager, I didn't like them. But as I began to mature, I began to realize that changing requirements are very often necessary due to the changing enterprise environmental factors, the organizational process assets. So why am I kicking against them? If our customer needs this, we need to welcome it. It says, welcome change, even late in development. So if a customer is asking for something different, 
you should have the right frame of mind to embrace that change. Delivering work in product frequently, why? Because if we deliver in increments frequently, we're able to tune and adjust. It's a risk coping mechanism. What about developers working daily? Again, it's a risk coping mechanism. The more interactions we have, the more likely we are to go off course or end up at different points of the pole at the end of the sprint or at the end of the project. Build projects around motivated individuals. This was the very first thing that came to mind when I showed you those sliders. Build projects around motivated individuals. How are you as a project manager, if that's your title, how are you giving the team autonomy? How are you inspiring the team? Do you know that it's your job to get your team to the peak state of performance, the optimum state of performance, to intentionally make them feel appreciated, not for your selfish gains or for the project gains, but just because it's the right thing to do. Give them the environment they need, great working conditions, great support, and get out of the way so they do their job. Did you know that? Yes, you did, from the world of Agile, but we need to bring these things into the world of predictive a lot more. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Now, for this video, it would have been very easy for me to leave the camera off. I could very well turn the camera off and I could very well get by by just showing you a bunch of slides, but, you're getting more of the communication. Why do you feel you're getting more of the communication? Because Professor Emeritus, Alba Moravian, he did an experiment at UCLA and you know what he found out? That in a face-to-face -face setting, when you have the ability to communicate, not just by words written on a sheet of paper or typed in an email or on a letter, no. When you have the ability to communicate face-to-face, -face, the value, the effect of the message is a lot more weighty than just words. You know, you've heard talk is cheap. Well, it's easy to just scribble out a message. But what Professor Emeritus Albert Morabian discovered is that in interactive communications, you have the words, you have the tone of voice, and you have the body language majority of the message is conveyed by the body language, over 50%, 55%. Just think about that. 55% of communication in an interactive setting is the body language. 38 is a tone of voice and only seven, a mere seven is the words. So when you as a project manager have the opportunity to turn your camera on, I know there are many of us that are still trying to get out of the crazy pandemic in our companies. We're still meeting virtually. You will still be meeting virtually for many months to come, but why not turn on that camera? You owe it to yourself, project manager, to engage face-to-face -face. or face-to-face -face isn't possible. How about the camera? Turn the camera on. This is what I tell our students at the Project Leadership Institute. And by the way, if you're looking for leadership training, coaching, mentoring within your career to get to the next level, you need to go to projectleadershipinstitute.com because these are some of the principles I tell our students are important, are important. So you might be a graduate, you might be PMP certified, but are you taking your project management to the next level? You need to be on that Project Leadership Institute. It will help you. But the key thing I'm trying to impose on you right now or impress upon you is put your customers first and put your uh, value on your communications a lot higher than you have in the past. So I could very well do this and I could communicate with you all day long without turning on my camera and I could very well show you slides and slides and slides but that is not the best way to communicate because now I'm communicating, even though you're getting what I'm saying, you are missing part of the message in you not seeing me. 
See that? You're missing part of the message. Let's go on to number seven. Working product is the primary measure of progress. So as a project manager managing a project without a cost component, your definite chief aim needs to be working product. The next one says agile processes promote sustainable development. Sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. So for this one, if you are a project manager in a more predictive setting and you do not have the cost component, but what I will say to you is, why not think about getting your team to the optimum position in terms of efficiency? One of the things you could do is just be aware of Tuckman's ladder. Storming, oh well, starts off with storming, but then you get to storming. So how do you get out of storming as quickly as possible to get to performing so that you're functioning as a well-oiled unit? A lot of these things, they may seem like they're not really the job of the project manager. <clears throat> you might think, oh, it's functional manager's work. No, it's not. It's your job. It's your job. It's your job to get the team to optimum efficiency. And how do you do that? Great leadership skills, great motivation, great inspiration. Number nine talks about continuous attention to technical excellence. Number 10 talks about simplicity, maximizing the amount of work not done. Do as little as possible to get the biggest bang for your buck possible. Number 11, best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. How can you take your will out of the equation give the team autonomy, give them power. And at the end of the day, you're going to get a bigger bang for the buck. The team is going to deliver far more than they could if someone was lording it over them and carrot and sticks and all sorts of awful behavior. So change the awful to the awesome. Take it from carrot and sticks to autonomy and power and self-leading and self-management. And it's not taking anything away from you, the project manager. It is instead giving you leverage. Last but not least, at regular intervals, you need to check. You need to adapt. So if you did, let's say you ran a, a phase, let's even not say a sprint, because we're trying to take this and make it very pragmatic for those of you working in government space and those of you working uh, using uh, tools that may not be agile in nature, but how can you adapt frequently, rapidly to get to the optimum position? A retrospective. How about having an open discussion? Nothing has been recorded. Nothing has been written. Not a lessons learned, but a retrospective where honest opinions are shared. You're trying to get down to the bottom of what can we do to help maximize our efficiencies. Don't record it, don't write it down. Let people feel free to air their ideas. And when people know, oh, nothing's been recorded, nothing's been written, they come out of their shell and they tell the honest truth. You get a lot more out of that than a lessons learned where everything is documented. And those lessons learned, you know and I know, no one's reading it. Everyone's tapped out, they've gone home, they come back the next week, the lessons learned are still on SharePoint. No one's opened it and they will not open it for the next five, 10 years, you know. So why not make it more pragmatic by going through the rites of passage of a retrospective, honest, candid sharing of ideas. People are more likely to share the brutal, honest, helpful, valuable truth when they know it's not being recorded and archived. That is why it is done that way in the world of Agile. The retrospectives are not recorded for lessons learned. But a lot of times we incorrectly equate lessons learned to a retrospective. They're not the same thing. There's a huge difference. Openness, transparency, and team member to team member accountability with brutal, honest truths not being scared of being candid, not being scared of having disagreements that take the team to a higher level. So my friends, if you are leading a project, you don't have visibility of one dimension or the other, I want you to always think about what I'm showing you here. 
think about scope, schedule, risk, procurements, and quality, and these things being of a more technical nature. You could say they're more technical. But when it comes to the bottom piece right here, resources, communications, stakeholder, being able to integrate everything, and of course, leadership, you can get a whole lot more bang for the buck by focusing on these things. And at different points, there might be a greater emphasis for the time, but don't lose sight of the fact that everything you do, everything in life, on projects and programs in portfolios, the business level, the company level, everything rises and falls on leadership. If you're a great leader, a great leader finds a way to steer the ship to its destination. I like a quote from John. John says, anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a true leader to chart the course. So my challenge to you is, can you chart the course and steer the ship as well? Chart your course. Think about those items I've gone over. Think about your specific projects and think about what is most important to you. In closing, I want to leave you with this option. If you are getting ready for your PMP exam and about to pass and you're like, oh, what happens after I pass? Well, after you pass, you need to be thinking about coming to join us at the Project Leadership Institute. The program kicked off many months ago and we focus on leadership with a project management angle to it. We focus on visioning our mission statements and our definite chief aim. And you will have a target, a goal of what you need to accomplish. You will also have the opportunity of being mentored trained and coached by me every single week. That's right, every week, every week. So we have a summit that holds um, the last uh, Saturday, usually the last Saturday of every quarter. But we've changed the program up a little bit in that every person will get the opportunity for one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching from me behind closed doors, no one else is in the meetings, just you and me. And we're talking about your goals, your ambitions, what you want to accomplish in your career and in life. And not only do I train you or mentor you, I also coach you. And if you've watched my videos on coaching and mentoring, you know the difference, but I coach you to get to your definite chief aim, whatever that might be in life. And if you feel, well, Phil, I have none, I coach you into finding it. And that is why if you are someone who is getting certified, I often say getting certified is not enough. So I want you to go on down to projectleadershipinstitute.com. And I want you to think about joining because your career is more than just PMP. PMP is, is just the beginning. What are you going to do with it? Where are you going to get to? And to get to your destination, you need to remember what my buddy, my mentor, John Maxwell said. He said, everything rises and falls on leadership. And speaking of John, on this curriculum, we had a special keynote from John. And when you come aboard the program, you will be able to watch that special keynote from John and understand how to be a real success. There's a lot of information that we cover. And I would love for you to join us on this adventure. All right. I hope this has been of help to you. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Tell your buddies, tell your friends about life after the PMP exam. It's just the beginning, getting certified. But take it to the next level afterwards. You take care. Speak to you soon.